Um, Article 3 of the Outer Space Treaty, though, says it's not just the space treaties themselves that's applicable okay. to space, but um, all of international law, including the Charter of the United Nations. Right. So that's a good thing. Yep. So you're incorporating all of international law. You're not just relying on the space-specific okay. treaties. Yep. Um, the fact that it includes the Charter of the United Nations, though, is um, good and bad in a way, because on the one hand, you, it means you're incorporating the prohibition on a threat or use of yep. force, which is part of the Charter of the United Nations, but you're also incorporating the inherent right of national and collective self-defense yeah, in okay. there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That if you can do it on Earth, you can do it in space. Yeah, exactly. Well. You can defend yourself yeah. as well. And it also incorporates the laws of armed conflict. Yep. Um, so if an armed conflict started on Earth, or even if an armed conflict started in space, yep then you can target any legitimate military objective, although you can target only legitimate military objectives and not anything else. Okay. So that's, again, is good and bad. Yeah. Yes. Interesting. <laughs> um, so Article 1 of the Outer Space Treaty also says that, that outer space is free for exploration and use by all states. Yep, okay. And now that's as applicable to any state as it is to North Korea, for example. Yes, that's right. So I've included here, uh, and you won't necessarily be able to read it, that's, that's not necessarily, but the UN Security Council said it was concerned about the development of ballistic missiles by um, North Korea. Yep. But, um, so it's resolution 2087. If you do look at it, one of the things you'll notice is that it starts with pretty much close to the top, recognizing the freedom of all states to explore and use outer space. So it says, we recognize that you, North Korea, have a right to use and explore outer space, but you can't develop ballistic missiles. And this is important because the technology, as we'll see, you know, and we've talked about rocket physics is just going up and ballistic missiles and rockets are very similar in the way they're built and designed. Right, right. You would be have to be close enough to see whether the nose cone is going to open yeah. and therefore and release a satellite and therefore is just a benign rocket or well, whether the nose cone is going to stay closed yes. and, and has a maybe a weapon in it. Interesting. Yeah. So they're realizing this is already a tricky scenario with some countries. Yes. Okay. Yes. Exactly. Um, you can't appropriate any part of outer space. Okay. All right. Which is to say that you can't, by claim of sovereignty, by means of use or occupation, or by any other means, put Planted a flag it. on planet Earth, on Mars, on Venus, on the moon, wherever else, and say, this is mine. Okay. Yes. Um, so this becomes important for uh, the discussion about space resource yes. utilization yeah. um, and, and extraction of resources from... Uh, you from can't the... claim that land and dig it out and prevent me from doing the same, right? Right, right. Uh, okay. It also, this makes sense because uh, you can't extend your national borders into outer space indefinitely. That's true. <laughs> a, a satellite... oh, Jupiter's in my, in my border for the next 12 years. All right, I got right. Jupiter. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, All right. yes. Interesting. A, a satellite, when it's orbiting, can't stop at your border yeah. and go around. Yeah, okay. It's just going to do what the laws of orbital dynamics <laughs> yes. require of it. Um, the laws of physics tend to trump the laws made by humanity. Interesting. <laughs> Somewhat good to know. <laughs> yes. Um, all states, all, all governments are responsible, they bear international responsibility for national activities in outer space. Yep. And that extends not just to governmental uh, activities, mm -hmm. but even to non-governmental activities. So, i.e., companies in that country. Right, right, and and this is this is quite different to normal international law. So, okay. normal international law would say a government is responsible if it is in some way involved in a non-governmental okay. activity. Yep. If, 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 the, if the company was acting at it as its agent, yeah, yeah. Um, or it authorised that company or, or something like that. Article 6 is different. It says, no matter what, mm. even if you specifically prohibited a company from doing something... You're still responsible. You're still responsible. And again, this is actually quite forward-thinking in 1967. You know, private space 
wasn't a big thing because it was pretty much national government funding. So this is quite important, especially nowadays. It is, it is. So um, I don't know if you've talked about the example of, um, of swarm technologies. No and their, their space B uh, satellites. Yeah. So, so very small satellites. The, in the US, the Federal Communications Commission said, we're not going to approve these. We're, we're, we're concerned that they're too small to track properly. Yeah. Um, and, and this is already on top of small satellites that are approved and already hard to deal with. Right, right. And, and, but by this stage, the company Swarm Technologies had invested a lot into it and they'd already uh, arranged a launch in India oh. as a US company and so even though they were told by the Federal Communications Commission that you don't have permission they went ahead with the launch of their satellites anyway um, and they were fined they yeah, got a, yeah, yeah. They, they got a big fine for it but the point is more that the US government would still be responsible for those satellites even though it had told Swarm Technologies that you can't launch them. And so I guess it's important reflecting back on what we talked about earlier, if they unwillingly crash into something or do something, even if it's in that green peaceful area, but kind of negligence, mm. it's the US government that is responsible. Yes. Even though they've already said no. Yes. Yeah, this is, and, yeah. And, and so the government has this, this uh, responsibility to authorize and continually supervise. Okay. So not just give licenses and permits, but even beyond those license and, uh, licenses and permits to continue to supervise yeah, the yeah. activities of a non-governmental entity. So in that scenario, is India responsible at all? Because they're the rocket provider. Right, well, they would be responsible as a matter of international law as well. And that's a matter for the US government to negotiate, to, to resolve the dispute potentially between the Indian government and the US government. Really? Okay, yeah, all right. Yes, but you can see then why states would want to have their own legislation. Yeah, yeah exactly. To, yeah. To, to exert control over commercial entities. So this is the Australian example, the Space Launches and Returns Act in 2018. And there is uh, legislation or regulations yep. and rules that are subordinate to that as well, that, that set out in a, in a lot of detail what licenses and permits you have to get in what circumstances and how to get them, yep. the, the information you have to provide. And again, this is Australia, where in the US it is the Federal Communications and Federal Aviation Administration that is doing this, not mm. NASA. That's right. Yes, exactly. So, uh, sorry. And then there is an obligation of uh, registration. If, if you're going to send a space ob object up there, you're obliged to register it. You don't have to provide that much information. Mm, mm. Uh, the date and location of launch, the designator, ba basic orbital parameters, and the general function of a satellite. And I think this is the surprising thing. A lot of people think that you know satellites are hidden, but you can kind of go to these databases and look up. Yes. You know, U.S. National Reconnaissance Office, U.S. National Reconnaissance Office, right? Yes. You yes. can see they've launched it. It doesn't tell you, as you said, what it's doing, no. but you can know when it was launched, where it was launched, and basically where it's orbiting. And I think that's the key for a lot of space stuff, right? right? Where is it so you can navigate with other satellites? Right, but there's not necessarily an obligation to keep it up to the moment. That's right, exactly, that is very true, yes. So you, yes, you can go to the United Nations Office of Outer Space Affairs and look for the Space Object Register and you'll see a lot of information about satellites there or, or you'll get this that, amount that of stuff. information. Yeah, exactly. But you're not going to be able to use that for space traffic management. No, you're not. Example. That's right. And that's a very important thing. Yeah.